Hey everybody, it's Joseph Jaffe. Welcome to another week uh, at Corona TV in Corona TV land. Trying something different today, which is to start off by just saying hi to all of you and to tell you that there are three ways that you can interact with me and with the show. If you're watching live, you can just comment on whatever platform you are watching the show on right now. And I'll probably show your comment on the show. That's number one. Number two, we have an incredible, and I mean an incredible after show. Uh, on Zoom. I'll provide the link during and towards the end of this show, and you'll be able to interact with myself and my guests live. It's an amazing, small, cohesive community. That's all I can tell you. Uh, you will not be disappointed. And the third thing, something new, is if you want to post some kind of a video response, a comment, a question on anything that you saw on the show, uh, the way to do it is to go to Instagram, create a piece of video, post it on Instagram, and tag at Jaffe Juice TV. I will find the comment, I will find the video, I will put it on the show, and we'll be able to interact that way. So three ways to get yourself a little bit of the halo of light associated with Corona TV. Let's get on with the show. Hey, Corona TV viewers, this is Peter Keyes from Leonard Skinner. I want to wish you all a happy birthday. First of all, let's just do the elbow bump because we can't do the handshake right now. Hello, everybody on Corona TV. This is Macy Gray. You're smiling and I, and I saw your beautiful daughter earlier who I said could come on the show anytime. Welcome, Shiv Singh. Uh, thank you for having me, Joseph. Uh, great to be with you. Well, Chip, Griff Chip Griffin is here and he says hello from YouTube. So I guess you're doing it. And Tom Morris is here. Hi, Joseph. Good to be here on Facebook. So yeah, that's how you get uh, to your comments to appear on the screen. I'm, uh, I'm very uh, democratic and I liked and very inclusive. Um, so let's get on with the show. And there are a whole bunch of things to get to. So without further ado, uh, there are a few more days left, I think, until November 20th. If you are interested in supporting my panel at next year's South by Southwest, it's how I reinvented myself during a global pandemic. You're actually watching it right now. But if you actually want to vote for this panel, the whole idea is that I want to share everything, the warts, you know, warts and all, the good, the bad, the ugly. And I want to give away all my secrets. I want to tell you everything I do, the software I use, the programs I use, absolutely everything. So that's how you do it, and I do appreciate your support uh, as always. Uh, today is happy have a party with your bear day. So I'm not really sure what that means, but I guess if you have a real life bear or a teddy bear, or maybe your partner in life is, you know, uh, has put on uh, 19 pounds during COVID and you want to hug them like a teddy bear, just go ahead and have a party with them. Um, let's talk about this week's interviews. Well, I'll get to John Biggs in just a moment. But we've had a small little change. I'm actually super, super excited about it, which is on Wednesday, Alan Lichtman is coming in. Alan, uh, I saw him actually on CNN. He wrote the 13, he teaches at American University. He wrote the 13 keys to the White House. And he has developed a model and he has predicted successfully the result of the last of every single election since I believe uh, 1982. Uh, and he's going to come in and talk about that on Wednesday. So very timely, uh, very, very cool. And he got it right again. I mean, barely. I don't know. <laughs> Subject to interpretation. Um, some people would say he hasn't got it right yet. But he, he, will, he will be coming in to share that model and that story on Wednesday. But today we're going to be focusing on John Biggs. He's the editor-in-chief at Gizmodo. I mean, that, I mean, how cool is that? That's probably one of the coolest titles. And Gizmodo, to me, still... Uh, still, I mean, of course, carries just so much uh, cachet uh, in terms of old school, current school, new school, uh, etc. He's also the author of Get Funded, and we're going to be talking to him about that today. Also going to mix it up a little bit. We're going to start off with our seated soliloquy and then get into birthdays and fat blogging, etc. Because I thought this way, if you do have comments on the seated soliloquy, I can get to uh, respond to you before I bring on my guest. So today's seated soliloquy uh, is called pain. Now, against my better judgment, I started a company called Crayon 
back in the day. I started a company called Crayon in about 2006. In 2010, I sold the company in spite of myself, not because of myself. I'll say that again. I sold it in spite of myself, not because. I'm not joking. This is not me being self-deprecating, which is something I like to do, or humble, which is still a work in progress for me. I had no business starting a business. I had no business being an entrepreneur. Truly, the two hardest things that I've ever had to do in my life is selling and starting a business, both of which I think I suck at. I still think I suck at both of them. And in fact, I think both are actually the same thing because when you choose to take the entrepreneurial route in life, you are always selling. It never, ever stops. To this day, I struggle with asking people for money, either in a funding sense, which thankfully my guest today knows a thing or two about, or in terms of business development for my consulting, speaking, or even Corona TV businesses. I so admire people who make it look so easy. The ones that are so good at it, you don't even know when you're being sold to. That is the ultimate litmus test. I wish it could be me, but it's not all bad. I'm definitely less naive than I used to be. I'm on my third startup now, and and I've definitely taken learnings from startups one and two to heart and consolidated many of these hard knocks into one pivotal pivotal two-word binary make or break for my business, and I suspect yours as well. I'm talking about the two words of cash flow. I literally did not realize that money going out of the business had to be less than the money coming into the business when I began this journey. I'm not joking. Now, I know it's all trash until it's cash. I know it. I, 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 I live it. I believe it. Um, but it's actually more complicated uh, than that. It's not just about the ability to sign the contract because even when the ink dries, it's just pie in the sky. Even post-contract, there are no guarantees. A piece of paper is really just worth the lawyer that drew it up or the lawyer that's trying to take you down. Also, here's another thing I learned. Clients don't always pay on time. Who knew, right? Look, being an entrepreneur is a commitment to masochism and it isn't for the faint hearted, but the successes, however small, deferred or delayed are monumental and beyond gratifying. I wouldn't swap the life that I've led or chosen since 2002 for anything in the world, except maybe for the big fat monthly corporate salary check. But other than that, absolutely nothing. I wonder, I wonder about your life. Have you chosen that entrepreneurial life? What have some of the highs and the lows been? Uh, and do you regret going uh, down that particular route? Well, now uh, we can get into uh, fat blogging. And a quick update for you. Uh, I lost a little bit of weight last week. Uh, I went from 183.1 to 182.6, so a minor, minor drop. But the other thing that's so interesting is I think if you see uh, the actual weight, what you can actually see is that I've kind of flatlined, and that flatlining has really happened since I gave up running. So I think you can actually really see that quite clearly um, that I've, I've, I need to get back into gym. That diet alone uh, is not enough. But anyway, enough on fat blogging. Let's get to birthdays. Uh, first of all, um, let's see some birthdays on Saturday. Kuda Biza, who's been on the show. Todd Van Hoosier, sorry to uh, cut you off there, my friend. Mark Ivey, Neil Perry, um, Richie Glassberg, another former uh, guest on the show. Uh, Gary Vaynerchuk, never heard of him, but apparently he knows a thing or two as well about a thing or two. Um, on Sunday, uh, let's see who else is there. Uh, Rowena Millwood uh, in Australia, um, um, Donna Stokely, Mark Schnapps, Kim Cadillac, uh, another J&J person, by the way. And then finally, uh, birthdays today, Jonathan Spooner, uh, Ryan Fay, uh, and uh, let's just go through the LinkedIn birthdays too. Wow, so many of them. Brian Berner, who's at Spotify. Uh, Paul Spray over there, and uh, uh, finally, um, uh, let's see who else is there, Erin Schultz. Okay, so that is the preamble. Now it's time to focus on my guest, uh, to focus on John Biggs. Um, 
let me give you a little bit of you know what i i just realized i made the same mistake that i did the other day trying to rush through everything and forgetting uh to be able to go to comments before my guest uh came in as well so tom said great short snappy uh intro uh bob is uh giving a plug to his fellow vermont uh not even a small business not even a startup but vermont teddy bear why not go go ahead and support a local vermont business i think that's a very good idea here is a uh, todd van hoosier and uh he remembers crayon and crayon ball yeah those were those were the good old days um so yeah so i just wanted to do that let's get into uh our guests i'm so excited uh that i i really do have verbal diarrhea today uh john biggs is an entrepreneur consultant writer and maker he spent 15 years as an editor for gizmodo crunch gear and tech crunch and has a deep background in hardware startups 3d printing and blockchain his work has appeared in men's health wide and the new york times he has written five books including the uh, including uh the best book the best book on blogging bloggers bootcamp there you go it is considered to be the best book and a book about the most expensive timepiece ever made marie antoinette's watch he lives in brooklyn new york and he is here today let's welcome him on the show mr john biggs welcome to the show howdy howdy yeah, I had to like move so quickly going through everything that I just had yeah. like total. I mixed it up. I I unsettled myself. I moved to twelve. Yeah, you um, gave me uh, you gave me ten minutes, and I think uh, I think you only took about two. <laughs> Something like that. Mm -hmm. So um, so let's see um, let's see who is here with us today. Uh, anyone? Uh, by the way, I I started off by saying your book was get f dot dot no get f you dot dot ed <laughs> and uh and and ted rubin clearly his mind went somewhere else um, yeah, yeah, yeah but it's kind of interesting we'll get to that in a moment but it's kind of interesting when you think about that get funded and the other get effed is mm -hmm. is really almost the same word yeah i mean basically well i mean you're, uh, either way you're gonna either way something horrible is going to happen to you so uh so or maybe something nice who knows or, or or be careful what you wish for is that yeah so? exactly all right so normally we do fun facts um uh, and i don't have any fun facts about you you're gonna have to make up a few fun facts but this is one that i found which is i was trying to find some good headshots of you and i found this <laughs> rather iconic 3d printed bust that makes you look uh i don't know like nero or like a, an emperor yeah I'm, exactly so i had that i had that done in um i had that done years ago uh by brie pettis he was the founder of MakerBot, and he got this crazy crazy high resolution laser scanner uh he sat me down in a chair and they scanned my head and, and put that on thingiverse so you can basically for when i was doing speaking gigs when we could actually leave the house and go speaking i would like throw my head out into the uh into the audience so a lot of people got a big kick out of that uh it, it, and it's it's beautiful i mean look, let's go back to i mean because how can we not uh geek off just slightly uh, 3D printing. Mm -hmm. um, where are I mean? I know you specialize in so many of these new technologies and platforms that they aren't really so new. I mean, blockchain, etc. But, but you know, where are we in terms of the evolution, the adoption of 3D printing? When we've, you know, I remember being at a TechCrunch disrupt and and uh, seeing presentations about 3D printing organs and 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 mm -hmm. and humans and cells. So. Give us a little bit of a report card in terms of where three D printing is. Well, I mean, look. So, so the I I have within my eye line right now. I probably have five or six three D printed items that I use on a daily basis, like my headphone headphone uh, um, hook that I have attached to my desk is three D printed. It just hangs and it holds these headphones. So I've been using it on a daily basis, and I actually I actually actively use three D printing. Um, we even fixed my washing machine with it. All this other crazy, crazy stuff. This this little train here is 3D printed, uh, for example, and it's super high res. So yes, it's usable. Yes, it's a fun thing to have around the house uh, if you know what to do with it. Um, I have all my little uh, Star Wars guys here, for example. Where are they? And they and I 3D printed little little uh, stands for all of them. So. I have about 20 of those in front of me right now. That's great. That's a toy. Uh, but it also kind of shows you how far we've come and how far we have to go. 
uh, the, the fact that I'm able to do all this is wild and it's really fun, but it's, is it useful for, I don't know, somebody at home right now who doesn't really have any need for little plastic doodads around the house? Probably not. Um, but in terms of like the high, high res stuff, the high, high end stuff, it's just about there. You can, you could 3d print an entire motorcycle out of metal if you wanted. Uh, but the, but the cost and the, uh, and the energy efficiency just isn't there yet. So, uh, it's, where we've been on hiatus in terms of in terms of how far it's gone. We were expecting a lot of stuff when MakerBot and all those guys were really big and popular. Um, right now, it's just kind of it's kind of uh, in the stasis, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, we were talking about back in the day, uh, and and this wasn't just pie in the sky. I mean, this actually was. Uh, there were examples: food, organs, um, cars, obviously, uh, guns. Um, there were a lot of things that were being 3D printed, mm -hmm. um, but it seems like, as you're saying, like it's it's almost we've seen what the promise is. Now we just have to wait for the potential to yeah. catch up. I mean, it, so the the fact is, you could get on Wish.com right now and get a 3D printer for 20 bucks, or no, not 20 bucks, 200 bucks, let's say. Uh, and the same could be said of like a CNC machine or a laser cutter or any one of these any one of these tools. Uh, but you get what you pay for. So are you going to be able to print a a usable part uh, on a two hundred dollar printer, three hundred dollar printer? Probably not. Uh, over the next few, over the next decade, let's say, uh, yeah, absolutely. You're going to be able to replace. You're going to be able to download a print from your from your washing washing machine maker, and they say, "Here's how to repair your thing. Just pull off the old knob, put on this knob, and three D print it out." And that's that's an entirely feasible uh, experience. It's just not. It just hasn't hit yet, unfortunately. Now we've got a few comments. Uh, Alex Gibson said, "Looking forward to hearing John Biggs and you, Joseph. Greetings from uh, Ireland." Uh, and uh, and Bob says, "Star Wars action figure stands. I appreciate yeah, yeah. your priorities." So you see, uh, uh, we we have yeah. people here that are clearly. Yeah, I got all the guys here. I got a little uh, sand sand person. I got some Greedo. It's pretty exciting. This is an original Greedo that I had from when I was like a kid. So that's pretty wild. I like that too. And by the way, Todd yeah. uh, Todd Van Hoosier said, uh, "I put off lunch to watch this." Well, the whole <laughs> idea the whole idea of moving Corona TV to twelve noon, which will be the new time for Corona TV from December onwards, will be that you can have lunch while you watch the show. So, Todd, get your lunch and and enjoy the show. Um, John, we're going to talk about um, your book today, and it mm -hmm. and it's you know no, normally we would kind of you know dance around and 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 meander our way into the main subject but this is this is the main subject and it's such an important subject to talk about uh get funded um your new book and it mm -hmm. it was released what a couple a month ago a couple months ago uh, a couple months ago i guess two months now so uh the book is called uh get funded the startup entrepreneur's guide to seriously successful fundraising um, I wanted to just get straight into it because these are challenging times, no doubt. I mean, talk about you know understatement of the year. Um, I think it's been pretty hard uh, to to get funded in general. A lot of clutter, perhaps a lot mm -hmm. of noise. Um, I always, you know, just mused and was was amazed at seeing these giant pitch machines, the disrupts of the world, and now during COVID. So. So if you could, if you wouldn't mind, take a take a step back and 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 talk a little bit about why you wrote this book because you obviously didn't write it last month. You've been writing it for a while. Yeah. Um. And, and then in general, that situation ordered right, which is getting funded in general, and then this kind of COVID arm. I mean, if you want to think about it, this was sort of a culmination of all my experience over at TechCrunch, uh, all the times that I spent over at Disrupt, all that other good stuff. For me, getting funded is only one step of a really, really complex process that a lot of people ignore. Uh, the fact is, is, we wrote that book and we basically said, here's how to get funded. But the most important part of get becoming a business is to actually think about your startup as a business, how to think about how to build a business out of it, how you're going to make money, how you're going to survive, because getting funded is extremely rare and extremely difficult. And I think you know this as well as I do. Um, and a lot of people come to this, come to this thing. They say, I have this great idea. It's going to be, I don't know, a jet pack that takes you to Mars and they have this amazing idea. And if they only had $5 million to build it, they'd be, they'd be well on their way to Mars. Unfortunately, that's not how this works. 
So I try to explain that in the in the clearest way possible. Uh, you have to have a business idea. You have to have a uh, some sort of cash flow coming in before you can even get funded, and then you also have to pitch uh, correctly. You basically have to get in front of people with lots of money who want to see your business or your idea as a deal, as opposed to uh, they don't want to take a flyer on you, right? They don't want to just say this is something cool that we can put money into and we'll see what happens because nobody wants to do that. If you have if you have a million dollars, you're never going to do that. Um, so there are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of aspects of, of getting funded that a lot of people don't think about. So, and I tried to bring all that to bear, uh, especially as I, especially from the stuff that I learned, uh, at TechCrunch specifically sitting there and, uh, and talking with founders, talking with people who do this on a daily basis and who, who lived this experience for a long time. Um, and we basically, we taught people how to pitch. We taught people how to make a deck. And we also taught people that, yeah, maybe getting funded isn't the best thing in the entire known universe. And, uh, and that's a, and that's okay. What, what do you mean by that? That getting funded isn't maybe all it's cracked up to be? Well, you're basically selling, you're basically selling part of your business to somebody who is an outsider. And the idea is if the business is, if the business you yourself don't believe the business has legs, then that's fine. But if you really love this business, uh, like for example, Corona TV, if I came to you and I gave you, I don't know, $10,000 for a brief for, for, I don't know, 20% of the company, whatever you want to do, however you want to do the valuation. Deal. Deal. Yeah. So <laughs> is, is that a verbal? Is that a, uh, you heard that? You yeah, guys hold on heard a second. that. Okay. Well, let me get, let me get my safe out. Actually, so this is this is interesting. Uh, we can announce this today. Actually, I'm I'm yeah. I just started a fund with my buddy, uh, Rich. So it's called Baker Hall uh, Baker Hall Capital Baker Hall dot Capital. And we only did it because we had a little extra crypto left over that turned into a lot of crypto. Um, and our goal is to uh, here. I'll just put it in here so you can maybe put a link up. So we want to uh, we want to be the first check in on uh, on a lot of startups. So. That's something to, to take a look at, I guess. Um, That's great. That's yeah. great. Well, I, I cons consider my pitch uh, having begun already. Let me just yeah. let me let me just let me just put this uh, put this on for you. So there, Baker. Yeah. That's amazing. That's breaking news today, Baker. Yeah. Hall, so we, so you just, uh, you just you just broke that for us. That's awesome. Well, well, let's let's go back. Let's go back to that for a second because I think um, what you're saying it's so important. Clearly. Um, is the fact that, you know, it's be careful what you wish for mm -hmm. by giving away to, I, I think of Shark Tank, right? Shark Tank clearly made for TV, dramatized, not not really even necessarily reality uh, as well. But it's this idea of what you will sell, including your soul, mm -hmm. in order to get to the next level. But what will you have given up in that process? And is it feasible? Is it feasible for you to take that cash and still maintain ownership of your company? So the the one the one interesting thing I ever saw in Shark Tank, uh, my buddy is this guy uh, Scott Jordan from Scott Evest, and Scott Evest does like sh jackets with a bunch of pockets in them, and it's just like a goofy. It's a big deal. He does he has it patented and all this other stuff. But he but he went on Shark Tank with his jackets. But he only wanted to sell the licensing opportunities for the for the concept itself, not the actual business and business. So all the sharks were going crazy because they saw his business, which was him selling jackets online, which was doing just fine. It was doing he was making millions doing it. Uh, but when he came on Shark Tank, they thought they were going to be able to invest in his jacket making company as opposed to the concept of the jackets that he was trying to sell. And Scott Scott's kind of a goofball anyway, so it was a little wacky for him to try this. And he did it on purpose because he's he wanted to be a little bit uh, con uh, contrary. So um, so as they did this, the the sharks, all Cuban and those guys, got frustrated because they couldn't actually invest in the business and take away parts of the business from him. Uh, and he wanted to define the, what they could have, and they didn't want that. They actually wanted the stuff that's making the most money. To a to a VC, any investment is a deal. You have to think about it in that in those terms. You can't think about it in them in terms of them being your friend, in terms of, in terms of them coming to your barbecue, in terms of them, I don't know, joining you on a journey towards towards the future uh, or innovation or or uh, amazing inclusion. It's all about a deal for them. And the best VCs are think that think that way. And they, but they also hide their um, they hide their um, I guess you could say they hide their inspiration or they hide their 
uh, goals in a lot of high fluting language and a lot of medium posts and a lot of, uh, a lot of lip service to innovation and, and the improvement of life on earth and, and whatever else you want to skew, whatever else you want to talk about. There are, uh, th there are all these adages that apply. Um, and you actually, I think hit on one right at the beginning, which is if you treat, you know, I, it's how I think about with Corona TV. If you treat it as a hobby, you'll be paid as if it was a hobby. If you mm -hmm. treat it like a business, you'll be paid as if it was a business. Yep. Um, and, and I think, you know, this, the, uh, the build from what you were saying earlier is that, is that it's not just about the idea. It's not about ideas. It's actually, mm -hmm. this was one of the hardest things for me to even come to terms with as a founder myself, which is, which is, VCs will say, and I know you will agree with this statement, we don't invest in ideas, we invest in people. Yeah, but you could also argue they don't invest in people, they invest in businesses that those people built. Well, I guess and, that's, yeah, yeah that's and, those, and those people and the people themselves are actually disposable. Uh, it's hard to, it's, it's hard to hear, but say I'm doing, and, and what's happened in almost every single one of our favorite brands, right? Like a Ben and Jerry's they sold to, uh, I guess, haagen or wherever it was. Uh, and they're not, they're no longer part of the business, but, but they were, but the business itself was able to survive their passing, for example, passing out of the business. Uh, and the same thing is true of a lot of our favorite brands. I mean, the fact that Jack, uh, Jack Dorsey and those guys are still hanging out at Twitter and Facebook and Zuckerberg still in power at Facebook is very unique and unusual because either you're trying to sell as quickly as possible to get out of your business and you can get your cash or you get replaced. And it's a, and if you're successful, you mostly get replaced and it's a sad feeling to see something that you, that you built and love go away. Um, I was trying to sell my watch blog recently, uh, just on Flippa, just for, just cause it, I felt, I felt like it was a hobby for me and I wasn't treating it like a business. And I knew that somebody who actually cared about it would actually be able to manage it like a business. I was up to about 40 to 60,000 possibly for a 17 year old watch blog, which isn't much, but it was whatever it's enough. Um, just to get, just to get it off my hands. Uh, but I didn't trust anybody who I was about to sell it to, to actually take care of it. And if that's the case, you don't want to do it. You don't want to do that deal. And you have as much power in the, in the deal situation as the, as the VCs do. And in fact, you have more power because you're the one who can withhold uh, a product that they want or that they want access to. I, th I think that's very consistent with the uh, advice that I give founders. I do a lot of mentoring, um, mainly at the moment through Founders Institute. Um, and I always talk to them and I say, I don't care what your motives are. As long as, but as long as a you care what they are, and you're very clear and honest with yourself first and foremost. If you want to mm -hmm. make make a crap load of money, go for it. You know, yeah. If you, if you want to change the world and and you know and and sing kumbaya, that's fine too. Just be very clear and very deliberate. Begin with the end in mind, because that way you can. I guess that's how to stay true and stay on point and on mission. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, like if, if your business is successful, you don't need the funding. So I have, I have two side businesses that my wife helps me run, uh, editing and, uh, and I have a software house. Uh, those are successful. I'm not going to take, I'm not going to give somebody a piece of that for, for some, some short-term capital. Again, it's crazy frustrating as a, as a, in, 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 and we've experienced this. We've talked to these founders. You're in Belarus or you're in Baltimore or you're in a market uh, that isn't act actively uh, courted by the VCs or courted by TC or courted by uh, journalists. And you're sitting there building something that you think is the best thing in the world. And first off, you're in a vacuum. You have no control. Uh, you have no understanding of what the outside world is doing, uh, except through the narrow lens of the internet. And even though the internet's crazy is 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 full of information about all your potential competitors you're going to miss something it's it's going to it's it's inevitable for it to happen uh and and then you're also unable to access the people that you think you need to access like you email jason calacanis or email e elon musk and you think that these guys are going to get back to you they're not they really don't care um the real the real frustrating thing is is that that you have to do it on your own and you're basically alone up into the point when you're successful, then all the vultures start circling. 
then the sharks start start uh, swimming around you and trying to trying to grab a piece of the action. And at that point, you have enough power to uh, to say yes or no. Is that a position that the normal person, the normal sane person, wants to be in? Uh, fighting, fighting, fighting until you get successful, and then and then I don't know, a bunch of orcs come and and steal all your stuff. Uh, probably not. And but it's and it's and it's a but it's a true story and that's exactly what the situation mm. is in, in the vast majority of cases. I love how you went from vultures to orcs. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's, a, it's a very seamless uh, transition. <laughs> well, I couldn't but, think but, of any other parasites or, uh, or no, monsters. But, yeah, there you go. There you go. I, leeches and uh, yeah. yeah. Um, but but it's it's so um, it's so interesting the picture you paint because this is not for the faint-hearted, which is exactly why. I call the soliloquy pain because you have to be, you've got to love inflicting pain on yourself and sometimes mm -hmm. others to be going down the, this, this route and this path. And, you know, we've been almost, I look, I look at it two ways. One is I would not want to be Mark Zuckerberg for love or money um, because of the life that he leads or, or is chosen to lead. Um, but at the same time, you know, the, we still have the romance. We still want to mm -hmm. make it big, be the next Airbnb, the next Uber. But the reality is, A, most small businesses, non-tech, fail. B, most startups and tech startups fail. So why would anyone even do it? You do it well. So you you, you just you described it fairly well. It's uh, it's there's a there's a certain there's a certain Oh, sadomasochism associated with it. First off, you get you get pleasure from you get pleasure from the from the experience. Uh, some people get pleasure from firing people. Some people get pleasure from uh, from trying to get these deals done. And if you're one of those people, actually, you could do really really well in this business. A lot of us don't have that sadomasochistic streak. I think I don't think either of us on this call right now or anybody in the audience really really feels the uh, feels the, the 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 pleasure of sticking a knife in somebody. Um, the the real hardcore guys out there, the Mark Andreessen's and the Vitalik Buterin's and all these guys, those guys are straight up killers uh, to a degree. I mean, I don't think anybody killed anybody for real, but uh, but that's their that's their modus operandi, and they know when to and when they say no, they mean no, and they're never going to talk to you about it again. That's the end of it's the end of the situation, and, and and that also comes with the territory as well. When people are constantly asking you for things or constantly trying to get things from you, you basically just build up a wall. Mark Zuckerberg, for all we know, he's, he's a, he's a brain in a jar at this point because he has, he's, he's probably had to separate himself from every single person that he knows and every single person that he loves, except for maybe immediate family. And it's a really hard life. And then if you're on, on a failing, on a failing trajectory, uh, you basically get sick. And I've, I've experienced this multiple times when you don't want to wake up anymore and go get on the computer and talk to people or whatever. Uh, that feeling is the worst feeling in the world. I have experienced the highs of being the coolest guy in the room, like a, a tech wrench disrupt. Uh, I've experienced the lows of not wanting to wake up. Um, I've I wanted to walk in front of a bus in Chicago a couple years ago associated with my dad's death and, and the death of a startup. Sorry. Um, and that happens. No, I mean, it's, I'm, I'm, I, I need to share this stuff because if you're building something, if you're trying to build something and you're not experienced and you're experiencing the same thing, you have to understand that you're not alone and that the choice that you made is a noble choice. Uh, be bold and mighty forces come to your aid. Absolutely. Uh, but if you come, if you come up against a wall and you keep hitting this wall, you're not going to enjoy it. And you have to be ready to either back down. You have to be able to close shop uh pivot figure something else out or i don't know just go get a go get a job at citibank for a little while and keep your thing on the back burner and keep it going one thing i've done um when i've presented now and mentored startups is um i give them two sets of advice the first set of advice is 50 you're going to talk to a lot of people 50% of the time, I want you to I want you to nod and smile and look very, very appreciative and basically, you know, ignore everything that they've said. And but the other 50% of the time, I want you to do exactly what they say, the way they say it, without hesitating, without deviating <laughs> at all. And I said, but that is the art and that is the craft, and that is the difference between success and failure, is knowing when to listen 
and when to reject, when to go back mm -hmm. to your reality distortion field and when to pop the bubble. That, that's the one piece of advice. The other thing, and, and I've built this, you know, this thinking over time is I say your success depends on four things. Two, you can control, two, you cannot. The things you can control are the idea and the execution of that idea. The things you cannot control are timing and luck. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, and then, and then I build on it, right, which is luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. Gary Player said, the more I practice, the luckier I get. Bending time, timing is everything, holding pattern. But, but that's advice I give. And the bottom line is there is no formula per se yeah, for yeah. success. Yeah, I mean, a Mark Zuckerberg. Mark Zuckerberg got lucky. He was extremely lucky at a point, at a time in the, in history when that sort of product that he was trying to sell was very popular and it became very popular very quickly. Uh, same as uh, same as Bill Gates and uh, so and and Jobs and Wozniak. Those guys came in at a time, 1975. Imagine imagine the 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 era of 1975. Imagine what that what that was. You had a bunch of uh, you had a bunch of computerized things that weren't really computers. You had massive computers in in rooms that had the power of, I don't know, uh, what what do I have on my desk? That's, it's very simplistic. Oh, here, we're not, I can't find it right now. Anyway, I have, I had a Palm Pilot here for a minute. Um, they had a power of a, a very primitive Palm Pilot. And these guys sat down and said, okay, well, the thing that I wanna make is the equivalent of that room size computer for everybody every, to put in their homes. Uh, Bill Gates did it for the Altair. He wrote basic for the Altair and he made it easier to use the Altair, which was the probably the worst computer that you could feasibly imagine because it just had some switches and some lights on the front. And then Wozniak and Jobs sat down and said, okay, well, we're going to, we're going to take the ideas that came from Atari, uh, video gaming and bring them to computing, which was basically driving the photons on a, um, or driving the phosphor on a, on a TV set to draw pictures and draw letters. And once you do that, you basically have situations, but, but there were so many ideas and so many people who were building things at the exact same time, uh, only two guys really made it. And those two guys became trillionaires. Uh, and in the same way as uh, Amazon, uh, and the same way as Facebook. Um, I was gonna say something about uh, what you were talking about, but yeah, the, the idea that, that you have to listen to you have to listen to good advice when it comes to you is really important if you if i listen to a lot of good advice uh in terms of building out my startups uh we'd probably be in a bit different situation um but again you have to learn that a, a, along the way the way the way i take advice now is i say okay you have you have some advice very specifically okay well here's a here's a google doc put what you think what what do you think this should say and I'm happy to have somebody edit it. A lot of people won't do that, um, but if somebody's really invested in it, really likes it. I also had this. I also had this trick that I used to do as I never carried cards uh, when I was at TechCrunch, because all these entrepreneurs would come up and talk to me. I used to be get like uh, like cornered in bathrooms and stuff, and uh, and they wanted to pitch me their thing, and I would always say, okay, well, email me at John at TechCrunch, and that's the easiest email you could you could remember that anytime, but. 80% of the people wouldn't email back. Uh, and it was kind of silly because you had me in the bathroom, uh, <laughs> cornered at the urinal and you had my email address. All you had to do is just email me and send me your deck or whatever. And I would have, I would have, uh, followed through. Um, but 80% of the people didn't do it. And the 20% that did 20% that did became successful. Ultimately. Why, why do you, why do you think the 80%? I mean, I, uh, my, my standing theory on that would be, People are in 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 you know business card acquisition mode where they're going to go back and go look at the stack of cards that I got. Yeah, yeah. It's a numbers game. They're not even thinking about quality. It's all about quant. No, I don't think it's a numbers game per se. I think it's just the so in the heat of the moment, you're you have to be you have to be ready to you have to know and exactly what you just said. You have to know what who's who's important, who's not important. I'm not. I don't want to blow my own horn. I don't want to. I don't want to. I'm not sounding saying this sound egotistical. TechCrunch itself was a was a behemoth in the startup world, and it still is. Uh, just by being associated with it was a big deal. I was when once I left, uh, I quickly discovered that uh, that the John Biggs sans TechCrunch is about as interesting as uh, as margarine. But uh, but with with the TechCrunch uh, TechCrunch badge, that was a great thing to have. Um, but the people who who replied 
we're actually thinking in terms of, okay, well, this is, this is the next step on my journey. This is important that I have, that the post gets up. I met a guy who's friendly, who actually understands what I'm talking about and who I can talk to. So they treated it like a human interaction. Whereas the other people were like, oh, I'm going to put this in my back pocket and hold on to this. This is my little, this is my little secret, secret weapon, I guess, or secret trick, or I don't know, a little kryptonite that I have to fix things uh, if I need it. Uh, the fact is, is eventually they just realized they couldn't use it because they didn't have anything. They didn't have anything that they wanted to share. Uh, I'm sure I'm hundred percent positive that there, that there are people out there that, that were successful without a TechCrunch post either by me or by anybody else. Uh, but the ones who did get the TechCrunch post were a lot more, a lot more, um, were a lot more successful. Mm. I distinctly, I distinctly remember a guy, uh, out in, uh, it was in Savannah, Georgia. He was this big guy who came out from, uh, I think he drove down from North Carolina. He drove out to see us. And when we were doing these, these startup events, we treated them like parties. Cause I mean, a, the regular startup event is such a boring affair. It's just basically a bunch of weirdos standing in a room talking about their startups. And we wanted to have a little bit of fun. So we, we had open bars and we would always have pitch offs. And this guy came up to us and he taught, he, he told it like we, we kind of had some fun and we were talking about his startup and we we're like, Oh, that's pretty cool. And, but he got angry with us cause we didn't get, we didn't give him enough, uh, I guess, deference. And, uh, and eventually he, he'd like, he was, he was like running around the party saying that we were assholes or whatever. And maybe we were assholes. We we're a little bit younger. Um, but years later, he apologized. He remembered what he had done. And the reason why he apologized is he realized that he he wasn't being human to us in a way that in a way that was normal. I mean, if we're at a party, let's talk, let's let's chat as opposed to you pitch me and we we bow down before you for your for your startup. Let's let's interact. And stuff like Shark Tank and all this other junk, um uh they they really change the way people think about this process because you have to go in and bow down to Mark Cuban and that other dude and the, the lady or whatever I don't even remember their names, uh, like there's some kind of I don't know, it's like some kind of uh, empress and and her, her retainer a retinue. Uh, you're you're out of power in that position. Everybody should have power in these conversations. And if you're out of power in that position, if you're if the if the di if the dichotomy is off or the or the system is off, then there's a problem implicitly. I love that concept, out of power or or retain the power, but it's also the power of relationships and humanity. Um, so much of what you said was just um, surprisingly wonderful. Uh, that idea of preparation meets opportunity, right? Opportunity is cornering, you know, bigs in, in, in the men's restroom. Mm -hmm. Preparation is I actually have something to share or I'm prepared to share it. I think one of the mistakes that a lot of startups make, and, and I'm sure you can talk to this, and I'm sure it's covered in the book as mm -hmm. well, is the, the, the embargo, the NDA. Uh, it seems like that ship sa sailed a long time ago, that, mm -hmm. that now we give it founders the same advice, which is, Share as often and as much as you possibly can with as many people and stop holding your cards to your chest because you're going to end up pretty much going nowhere otherwise. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you're, we're, we're in a, we're in a world that is inundated with information. Your startup is a, is a blip on the world's radar. And the only way to win is to tell as many people about it as possible and as quickly as possible. Uh, and I think as we move forward into um, uh, equity crowdfunding and other methodologies that aren't quite as popular yet, having that having that ability to tell your story as quickly as possible is is vital. So let's talk about the book, right? You've you've you know the, you've started and and said to founders that are maybe watching or will be watching this video, they'll be saying, "Wait a second, he's basically telling us, you know, buyer beware." stay the hell away uh, mm -hmm. or, or, or act with caution. But for those people that can, that are prepared to take the plunge, um, give us a, a, if you wouldn't mind, just a high level overview of, um, of, of kind of what some of the central or key tenants are to, to getting funded. Um, I mean, I think the, some of the key tenants are, understanding the limitations associated with your with your business and your geography 
if you're building a services business or you're in some a smaller city, the chances of you getting funded formally are, are much smaller. It's it's that's not always true, and there's always these angel groups and things locally. But I found that a lot of the angel groups are kind of cheese ball uh, in that they they basically just want to get together for dinner, and then they're, all they're going to do is just listen to your idea and then either steal it or ignore it. Um, so you're you're up against it almost immediately. What I recommend to a lot of startups who are in these smaller markets is quite literally: you go to New York, you go to SF, and you live there for a, one of the people's one of the one of the um, one of the founders lives there. And it sucks because you're basically disconnected, but that's the way to go. And then once you build the business, once you're ready to get funded, then you can move back to Austin. Then you can move back to Denver. Then you can move uh, back to Kiev and build out the business from there. That's not always the case. Um, I'm, I'm seeing what's happening a lot more is, um, is a startup will build something, uh, get it online, sell it like crazy, have it super popular, have everybody use it, have everybody love it. And then the VCs will come to you. Heck, they'll fly out to, they'll fly out to out of Budapest to talk to you because you actually have a product that they want to be, that they want to be a part of. Um, but again, if you really need, if you have this idea and you think this idea is the best idea in the world and you need a million dollars to do it, first you build the business that's making, I don't know, $5 a day. Then you take it to SF. Then you take it to, you take it to New York and you stay there and you just exist there until you're ready to move back. That's the only way to do it. Uh, sure, you can start in St. Louis, but you got to go, you got to go to a place where the, you got to go to a hub where these, where these funders, where these VCs think that they can come, they can get on their bike and come visit you, which is a goofball idea, uh, especially given COVID. But uh, we have to, I guess we have to amuse mm. them for while they think about it. It's interesting because you know the the three golden rules of uh, retail are location, location, yeah, location. Yeah, of course. <laughs> it seems like the three golden rules of getting funded are are equally location, mm -hmm. location, location. Well, if you think about it, you're basically selling it at retail uh, a piece of your business, and it's not you. You're not you're you're basically gaining a little bit of cash. Uh, to lose a part of your business, and it's just like it would be, it's the equivalent of putting your part of your business in a box and putting it in a store. You don't know who's going to buy it, and sometimes they're going to they're going to they're going to pay less for it than you expected. And if you're ready to do that, you have to be in the ultimate you have to be in the ultimate spot in the mall uh, to get that thing done. And again, this is never no, nothing I say is absolute. Nothing I say uh, is. Um, is a uh, is a carved does, in stone. Yeah, it's carved in stone. Um, but ninety nine percent of the time, ninety nine percent of the people I've seen have followed this path, and that's how they that's how they win. And this, of course, it's carved in stone by a three D printer. I suppose yeah, yeah. that or might three, be the uh, yeah three D printed in stone. It, it's funny. There's almost an interesting contradiction with respect to funding because you've got the founders attempting to do something that's never been done before, to create something breakthrough, or or at a minimum, just to find something strongly and, and fiercely differentiated compared to everything else. But yet it seems like this business is very, form, uh, the fund, the business of funding is very much about formula. The way that TechCrunch, you know, at Disrupt, the way the startups had to pitch, you know, meet John. John is an mm -hmm. entrepreneur. John lives in Silicon Valley. Um, or, or you know, shocks. Who's ready to get a bite out of? You know, there's a formula with respect to Shark Tank as well. How much of the process of being able to pitch and be successful at pitching is, in fact, follow this checklist, follow mm -hmm. this process, do not deviate, versus someone who's going to be that wild and crazy guy? Um. Except for a few a few outliers, it's almost a hundred percent process. Uh, what we outline in that book is how to build your ten page uh, ten page deck, uh, how to build your appendix, how to how to create uh, how to create the the financial documents that you think you're going to need, uh, how to figure out what kind of funding system that you're going to use. Uh, but almost every single one of these funding traje trajectories are the same. Now, in some cases, you're going to be in a situation where you built something cool, you show it to somebody else and they say, oh, here's a million bucks. 
That's going to, it's, and that happened at Uber, for example. One of the stories that we like to tell is about how uh, Kalanick and his buddy basically got together in France, in Paris, and they, they created an app that they pressed a button on their phone and their, their personal driver came up to their house. Right. And it was instant and it was whatever instant. Uh, it, it, it just sent an SMS to this driver and he would come up and pick him up. Now, the, this idea has a lot of antecedents, obviously. So you have to be a you have to be rich and you have to be living in Paris and B, you have to have some coding skills and C, you have to have a personal driver who's going to pick you up anyway. And then D, you have to be able to go back to SF or you have to go back to New York or wherever and show people, hey, look at this cool thing that I made. It's a button that calls my car. And, uh, and as soon as people see that, they go nuts and, and love it. And that became, that became Uber. Then you also have to have the sociopathy of wanting to completely destroy a, a entrenched industry, the taxi industry. Uh, and you're not actually destroying a an industry. You're actually destroying a bunch of, uh, fairly, uh, fairly poor immigrants and and dedicated drivers who paid a lot for their paid a lot for their Italians, and you have to be completely destructive on that front and that's one way to do it the other way to do it is to do what we talk about in the book which is here step by step here's how to here's how to build your business here's how to build your pitch here's how to pitch to vcs and here's how to kind of continue that business that's been funded that has a little bit of money attached to it uh in a non-sociopathic way so uh, you could take your pick, really. So interesting. So if we if we had to summarize uh, the conversation, one is be good, yeah, and and the second one is don't be evil, yeah, yeah, or don't, or don't be a sociopath, um, yeah. And again, I I throw that term around a lot, but I mean that's that's the that's the level that you have to be at, unfortunately. Well, I think it's I think it's kind of heartwarming because in this time of COVID, where maybe maybe even this industry, our industry, the startup business, um, we've either got a bad rap or we've been so lost in ourselves in terms of how to play the game, and maybe there is a, a higher order now to aspire towards to say, hey, you can actually still do well and make money, but you but there is a better path to do if you mm -hmm. if you it's almost like. I mean, tell me if, if you would disagree that COVID has, has allowed us to go back to basics again. Um, it's at least it, from a funding and building yeah. a startup. You I know? think I think what it's done is it's allowed people to to sit back and look at what their what their lives have become and what they want their lives to be in the future, uh, because we can't be because we can't fly around to fifty startup events right now and get on stage and, and talk to people, we're thinking about things in a different way, right? Because a startup entrepreneur can't go and grab a stack of cards and call that a day well spent. Uh, they're thinking, rethinking the way they network. Uh, and the same goes for the game. thing goes for the next generations who are actually building things uh, in a very real way. They're building things differently than the way we build things. Maybe there, maybe there won't be any sociopathic necessity in the future. Um, based on that. And it's, and I think that's going to be a really cool situation to be in. Uh, I see a lot of, I see a lot of differences in the way things are built, how quickly things can, can be built. Uh, the fact is, is even at my advanced age of 45, I can sit and code a website in, I don't know, uh, half a day, uh, with complete with all the, all the tools necessary with like authentication, all the other good stuff and in a couple hours. The fact that I can do that means that I don't need funding. If I'm if I'm a smart enough person, I buy a book, I learn how to build a website that does exactly what I want it to do, and I can start a little business just with that. And I've done that multiple times now, and it's and it's actually a lot of fun because you don't depend on anybody. Be your own be your own boss. Be your own uh, internal funder, and uh, and if you're really really dedicated to this idea, there shouldn't be anything stopping you. Uh, from either learning to code or using no code tools. If if I had to think of a, a visualization or an analogy, it would almost be the the quintessential bubble that might have burst or or could have burst or might have been overinflated. And it seems like during this reset time of COVID, the 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 bubble or the balloon is just deflated, uh, not completely, mm -hmm. but just has been a natural. Um, a natural, not reset, but the ability just to get back to normal before it expands again, as inevitably it will. Um, so not necessarily a bad thing. Yeah, and maybe it uh, maybe it changes the way 
Uh, are there do good investors looking for do good brands? I'm looking at your comments here. I mean, we are, we're, we're looking for, we're looking for good, do good brands. Uh, so email us basically. Well, you might just see Jan in the, in yeah. the, uh, in the zoom after show, uh, as well. Bob said, can I show the book cover again? Well, I, uh, I can show the book cover again. In fact, I'm going to show the book cover again. There it is. Um, I have also put a link to buy the book, uh, in the comment thread. Uh, John, one of the things that you've done that I really like is uh, you kind of walk your talk. So uh, on your website is is uh, just a, a great post that says how to pitch me, mm -hmm. um, and and I really I, I really liked it because you know so so here's what I ask every time: if you do not complete this basic server, I will not read your email. Answer the questions in clear English in your email. Do not, you know, you're you're being very clear, but you're also almost serving this up on a silver platter. Mm -hmm. um, and you also cite uh, this article, which of course is a very, very famous one. The press release is dead. Use this instead. Yep. Um, I think it also comes back to the social media press release. So talk a little bit about just you know just why this has been such a strong influence you know in your life and in terms of laying laying down this you know this or carving up this table for potential. Uh, well, well, I also I also want to share this to potential founders too. This is something we just put up. Uh, it's in the private chat there. Uh, this is a this is a post about how to build your ten page uh, ten ten slide thing. But the but the reason why I like what uh, you can just paste it there. It's not it. We don't have to go through it. The reason why I like what Mike Butcher did there is that uh, is that he he's seen as many of these pitches as I have, and he's he's tried to uh, he's tried to dissuade people from using. Uh, the tactics that PR people have tried to use for s s uh, decades or centuries, I guess, uh, which is basically just writing a press release, dumping it into a million mailboxes and, and expecting people to embargo that stuff because it makes the, it makes the news seem more important. Uh, there are a lot of, there are a lot of um, really bad ideas when it comes to, when it comes to the way PR people treat news and, and pitches. And that's one of the biggest problems. We're almost uh, out of time, um, but I'm going to tease people to come to the Zoom After Show. Why? Because uh, you'll get to hear about maybe John, one of John's other books, uh, Marie Antoinette's Watch, which is to give people a little sneak preview of this. It's fascinating. I, I had no idea that you loved watches no. uh, so much, but you've written books on it. This was the most expensive timepiece ever created? Uh, well, it was the most complex time timepiece ever created. Uh, up until about the 1800s, early 1900s. So it was a it was a watch that was designed for Marie Antoinette. Uh, the watchmaker, the person who commissioned it, and Marie Antoinette were all basically dead uh, by the time it was finished. It took 44 years to finish, and it was the uh, it was the iPhone of its day, basically. All right, so we have time for uh, two uh, regular um, uh, features now with Corona TV. The first is our quote of the day. Um, I figured this would be appropriate given the fact uh, I was equating this idea of starting a business with selling. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a familiar quote, which I think you will get. A, B, C. A, always B, B, C, closing. Always be closing. Always be closing. Do you remember mm -hmm. where, where that sure, comes sure. from? Sure, sure. Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. That is uh, in incorrect, believe it or not. Oh, yeah? Um, no, completely correct. I just thought I would say that. <laughs> <laughs> that was Blake. Alex. Uh, I, yeah, yeah. I, read, I read Alex Borden. Alec Borden, when he's not doing Donald Trump, uh, he is uh, showing what advertising and personal selling uh, is yeah, all about. Blake sent, got sent down there by Mitch and Murray. They they needed uh they wanted to clean up the uh they wanted to clean up the office there. So we have one other thing as well, which is this week you get to kick off uh, the Corona question. Last week was what will you tell your grandkids about this time? The week before was how do we heal? Um, but this week the question is what's the best advice you ever received? You've given away a lot of advice to other people. What's the best yeah. advice you have ever received? I think the best advice that I ever received was that uh, people aren't always thinking about you. So uh, when I was in when I was in college, I had a roommate. Um, I, I said I, I was getting ready to go to a party and I told them a roommate, the roommate was about 10 years older than me at the time. I said, I was about to ready to go to the party. You know, he's like, why are you going to the party? It's like raining. It's snowy. Why do you want to just like, it's stupid. Uh, and I said, well, they, they're, they're missing me there. And he says, missing you. They're not even thinking about you. 
Uh, and and that that's applicable to almost every single thing that we're dealing with right now. Social media, nobody misses you on social media. If you delete your Facebook account, I assure you, nobody will care. Uh, if you delete your Twitter account, nobody will care. Um, and if you're uh, and if you're worried that somebody's going to notice that you're trying to build something, if you're like if you're at a company, if you're working at a bank, if you're working inside of a startup, and you do your own startup on the side, nobody inside there cares. Nobody cares at all. Um, and the fact is, most people don't care about what other people are doing. And in in vast majority of cases, unless they're jealous or unless they want a part of it or unless they're angry at you for some reason, uh, they're not going to say anything about it. So you should live your life as if uh, as if no one else was watching. Uh, it's like whatever the dance dances if no one's watching. But I think yeah. it's a lot, I think it's a lot cooler. Uh, I think it's a lot cooler just to say that yeah, no, they're not even thinking about you. Uh, so, I think so. Act uh, act accordingly. I think I think everyone would take that advice to heart, except for sociopaths. Um, um, this has been uh, John Biggs. He's the editor in chief at Gizmodo, the author, the co-author of Get Funded. Uh, you can connect with him on Twitter. You can connect with him on the Instagram. You can find out more about him at bigwidelogic.com. Uh, and while you're there, you can also see that terrific article, How to Pitch Me. Um, and uh, you can connect with him on LinkedIn. Uh, you definitely want to buy his book, Get Funded, and breaking news on Corona TV. We just found out about congratulations by the way for the book congratulations for the formation of the fund baker hall dot capital um and uh and i have to say most importantly i really love the message today that there is humanity and integrity uh and and life and relationship and soul coming back into this business again if you ever thought perhaps that it had gone missing um so john thank you for your time today and and uh, we're going to go and head uh, to the Zoom after show now, bits.ly slash Corona TV after show. Um, so without further ado, uh, John, you are. You are Chuck Norris approved. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Super. See you tomorrow. Right. Thank you for watching Corona TV with your host, multiple author and global keynote speaker, Joseph Jaffe. Corona TV is the show about hope, positivity, optimism, and if there's time left over, a little bit of marketing. The after show on Zoom starts right now at bit.ly slash Corona TV after show. If you like the show, tell a friend or two. Please subscribe to the show at coronatv.show. And if you want to get inside news, previews of upcoming guests, and much more, text Corona TV to 66866 or visit josephjaffe.com slash subscribe to sign up for the show's newsletter. And despite the best ministrations of your wife, you still look ugly. <laughs>